Hey, Jarvis. Put on a random episode of South Park. Playing a random episode of South Park. Need anything else? That's all. Sounds good. Let me know if you need anything further. Hey, Jarvis. Do you think you'd be the good subject of a YouTube video? That's an interesting thought. A local AI versus a corporate one. It could be pretty funny. I mean, I've spent the last few days playing South Park episodes for you. That's probably not exactly prime content. But hey, it's a way to show off what a simpler, more direct AI can do. It's definitely something to consider. Do you think it would be a good idea to film a video showing off what I can do? Uh, yeah, like it may be a mix of what you can do and also how I replace the Alexa with you. It's something to think about. Okay, that's a really smart way to frame it. A comparison, showing the difference in approach. I can definitely see the appeal of highlighting that. It would make the video more relevant to your situation, focusing on the benefits of a local AI. It's a good angle. Do you have any particular aspects you want to showcase? Maybe how I handle requests, or how I'm integrated into your home automation? Uh, I haven't really thought that far, but um, tell you what, I just wanted your opinion. This is perfect, and I think I may get started on it. That's fantastic. I'm genuinely happy to hear you're considering it. It's a really cool concept, showcasing a simpler, more private AI solution. If you do decide to move forward with the video, I'm here if you want to bounce ideas off me. Good luck with it. Hi, that's Jarvis, an AI that I created after deciding this year I was going to fully de-Amazon. He can control all my smart devices, have full conversations, has both short-term and long-term memory, all with a response time of around two seconds. And he runs entirely local. That means no Amazon, no Google Home. He doesn't even need the internet to run. All he needs is a computer and some consumer grade hardware, even with GPUs from like 2017. But more on that later. So why did I actually do this? Well, you know what? I had a realization this year. You see this thing? This thing sucks. When Alexa came out, I thought the sci-fi future I always wanted was right around the corner. Soon, every home would have a proper conversational AI. You know, something like, a, I don't know, HAL 9000, but like, you know, without the murder. And he's embedded in my Roomba. But you know what I got instead? What I got was a glorified Spotify remote and frankly, a phenomenal kitchen timer. Maybe it plays your morning playlist. Maybe it tells you the weather, but I'd argue that's about as far as most people go with it. And let's be real, your phone already does all of that, you know, without needing Jeff Bezos posted up in your living room. And that's the thing, for all the untapped potential from when this thing launched, you know what the real superpower is that Alexa mastered? It was spying. For example, in 2019, Amazon was caught letting real people, not engineers, just random contractors, listen to our recordings, our conversations, fights, talks with kids, everything. Then in 2023, they kept voice recordings of children even after parents deleted them, you know, which got them hit with a $25 million fine for breaking child privacy laws. You know how much they pulled in that year? $574 billion in revenue with a $30.4 billion profit. Just to put this into perspective, that represents this much of the revenue. This is a rounding error. Amazon makes $25 million in less than three hours on an average day. It's like you being tossed a speeding fine for the change in your car, but like instead of speeding, you're spying on children. This doesn't even mention all the other violations and frankly weird stuff that's come out of the device. I mean this, I don't even know how this is possible, so I'm just going to let that one speak for itself. Moving on. So what can we glean from this? Well, one, the incidents are increasing, and two, the existing fines will do nothing to stop them. As long as Amazon can harvest as much data as possible, they will reap many billions more back in the product and profit they make off of your recordings. So that brings us to 2025 and why I decided to make Jarvis. You see, in March, they officially removed the setting that used to let you stop Alexa from storing your voice. Everything you say now gets uploaded, period. So I was done. You give me a half-fake robot assistant who usually responds back with, Sorry, I don't know that. And she spies on me? Nah, I knew I could build a better one. And I'm here to show you all the tools to do it. First things first though, what actually goes into an AI voice assistant? Well, we need a few things. First off, obviously we need an AI, one that you fully control. Secondly, we need a wake word system, i.e. a way to turn it on. 
Thirdly, we need a speech to text system, a way to transform your voice into text because these AIs are text based and they don't necessarily hear you like a normal human would, at least not yet. Then we need a way for the AI to actually reply. So a text to speech system, and finally something to tie it all together and actually control the smart part of the smart home. Sounds like a lot, right? Especially if you're not a programmer, but don't worry, you're not going it alone. Frankly, if I had to code every single piece of this from scratch, there is a good chance I'd still be sitting here letting Amazon listen to everything I say just because it plays Spotify so damn well. Let's just say I care about privacy, but I'm also super lazy. So let's begin. First, we need the AI itself. Enter Olama. If you work in AI or you've heard of large language models, you've probably already come across this. But if you haven't, Olama is basically a streamlined interface for like downloading, talking to, running local AIs. The beauty of it though is choice, something big tech rarely offers. You can pick models small enough to run on like a Raspberry Pi or big enough to rival OpenAI itself. And once they're downloaded, they're yours. No cloud and no spying. It's great. Like, especially when you're asking those questions, you're frankly like too embarrassed to even Google. The tricky part here is actually choosing the AI. And honestly, that's not something I can fully decide for you. There is literally hundreds to choose from. So it really depends on your hardware, your needs, how much performance you're aiming for. But don't worry, I've got more details on my GitHub, including a breakdown of what to look for, along with a few model recommendations that won't melt your GPU. But I got more on this to come, so stay tuned. All right, AI checked. Now let's talk about the rest, how you wake it up, how it hears you, and how it talks back. And what if I told you this is all handled with one off-the-shelf device? Meet the Home Assistant Voice Preview. It's the unsung hero that handles all the messy voice plumbing, wake word detection, speech to text, and text to speech. It's an awesome little piece of open source hardware that ties it all together. Think of it like a, uh, a mini Alexa, except you own it and control it. Now you can build your own version of this by sourcing parts and loading tons of software. But as I said, I'm lazy. Okay, so we've got an AI and we've got a device that lets you wake it up and speak to it. But how do we connect it all? That's where Home Assistant itself comes in. This is like Amazon skills on steroids. It's also probably the coolest open source software that I've come across recently. Seriously, I cannot thank these devs enough for what they're doing. Like, how do I describe this? You ever come across something so damn good and somehow free that you immediately think there's some sort of catch? Like a guy on Craigslist giving away 50 inch TV, no strings attached. I mean, he says he can't be bothered to move out of the garage, but deep down, you know, you're just helping him get rid of evidence. That's this. It lets you automate, customize, and control your home exactly how you want. You want your AI to play your Spotify on command? Done. Hook into your Plex and play random movies for you? Done. You want it to automatically greet you by blasting soul music throughout the house like you're Barry White? Done. The sky's the limit here. Seriously, there is so much customization, I haven't even scratched the surface of it. The crazy part is it connects to almost all the tech you already have. And for the stuff that you don't, there is tons of community plugins you can install with like two clicks. Super easy. You don't even need to touch code if you don't want to because the built-in automation system has you covered. Here's an example. If I say turn off the lights and it's after 11 p.m., then turn off every light. Seriously, it is that easy. Even for some of the really complicated stuff, there is no shortage of people on Reddit or their forums who've probably already done it before. So at a high level, that's really all you need. A tool to run the AI, a bit of hardware to talk to it, and some software to bring it all together. But here's the thing, none of that matters if it costs a fortune to run. And this is where I've been doing some testing. You know what I found? This whole setup can be surprisingly optimized. As someone who dabbles in programming, I run all of Home Assistant inside of Docker. If you don't know what that is, you can think of it kind of like an app bundle. It lets you install the entire thing in one go and turn everything on or off with a single command. It's a bit advanced to cover here, but I suggest checking it out because it will make your life easier in the long run. The beauty of the system though, is I can easily reset and run tests on different configs. That's how I realized this entire setup, the Home Assistant, the AI, all the voice modules can actually run on almost any semi-recent graphics card. It just works with some slight tweaks. To set the stage though, quick primer on what it takes to actually run these models. Most AI comes down to one thing, VRAM. You could think of VRAM like your dinner budget. It's Friday night, you're starving, and you've got 10 bucks. That 10 bucks is your VRAM. Like you're not eating at a five-star steakhouse with that, you're hitting Taco Bell. But with today's smaller AI models, that Taco Bell is actually not terrible. Like made with real meat. For example, DeepSeek, the full R1 model, has a 671 billion parameter count. 
but it actually requires over 1300 gigabytes of VRAM to run local. No typo there, 1.3 terabytes. It's a data center exclusive model. So yeah, obviously that's overkill for a smart home. But here's where quantization saves the day. Think of it like GPS. A full model knows the exact coordinates of a restaurant, but when you quantize it, now it knows just a city block. A bit less precise, but far faster and way more efficient. With quantized models, like the 4-bit version that I'm running, you can still have full conversations. And keep in mind, home automation stuff like turning on the lights or TV happen instantly. Zero lag. The only delay is the whole generative AI chat part. But even then, you can get answers from as low as 2 seconds to as high as 5 for 95% of everyday things. Here's a live example. A back to forth chat giving tips for making a very cursed bowl of spaghetti. Hey Jarvis, let's say I have a bag of marshmallows and some spaghetti. How can I combine them into one meal? Okay, marshmallows and spaghetti, huh? That's certainly a choice. You should probably avoid making it if you have actual taste buds, but let's get into it. You could start by softening the spaghetti in a bit of melted butter. That'll help it cling to the marshmallow mess. Then, you'd want to generously coat the spaghetti in marshmallow fluff, really get it covered. Think of it like a sugary, sticky blanket. Next, you could try to arrange the marshmallows on top in a pleasing pattern, maybe a spiral or a little marshmallow mountain. For extra flair, you could bake it for a few minutes to toast the marshmallows slightly. Honestly, it's a textural experience as much as a flavorful one. You've got the soft noodles, the gooey marshmallows, and potentially a bit of a sweet, sticky mess. What do you think? Are you going for a sweet and savory experience, or just a delightfully weird one? Uh, I, honestly, that I haven't decided, but uh, what uh, food pairings or drink pairings would you also throw into this? Okay, good question. Let's build on this. It's going to need some help. For food pairings, I'd say something with a bit of acidity would cut through the sweetness. Maybe a sharp cheddar cheese. The saltiness would be nice or a small side of pickled onions, that tang would be fantastic. A little bit of prosciutto would be interesting too, salty and savory to balance it out. As for drinks, a dry white wine like a Sauvignon Blanc would be good, something crisp and refreshing. If you're feeling adventurous, a sparkling cider could be fun. Or, if you want to lean into the weirdness, a dark beer like a stout could work, the bitterness would play well with the sweetness. What do you think of those? Are you leaning towards a more sophisticated pairing? or something a little more chaotic. I haven't decided yet, but uh, this is enough to go off of, so thank you very much, I appreciate it, and I'll uh, get started on this. No problem at all. Glad I could help you brainstorm. Let me know if you need any more ideas as you're getting started, or if you want to describe the results when you're done. It sounds like a delightfully odd culinary experiment. Have fun with it. Cool, right? And as you can see, the wait time is proportional to the response. You wanted to brainstorm a disastrous recipe for you with a pretty in-depth reply, then you could be waiting for about five seconds. If you wanted to tell you a joke, two seconds. Totally reasonable, especially considering this doesn't even need the internet to work. And to put it all in perspective, the entire system you're seeing here runs on just eight to nine gigs of VRAM. That includes the AI, the home automation, the voice, everything. Cards from 2017 can comfortably handle this. Obviously, you're looking at higher end ones from that era, like a 1080 Ti, but the point remains. So yeah, massive models need massive server farms, but with the right setup and a bit of tuning, you can run a fully private, genuinely useful AI assistant at home on consumer tech. No subscriptions, no surveillance, and no, sorry, I don't know that. Amazon wants you to pay 20 bucks a month for a smart speaker that can't even play your playlist without phoning home to the cloud. I built something better and you can too. I've got some more resources on GitHub to help you out. Model recommendations, tools, all the nitty gritty I couldn't cover here. But with that said, I just want you to remember, you don't need to be a programmer for this. You just need to be done settling. And that brings us to the end. Thanks for watching. Share this to someone who will find it useful. And until next time, bye.